Dune. This book was so iconic, it practically rearranged the stars. To this day, it's one of the most important science fiction series. Like most famous pieces of literature, this book still sparks a whole bunch of conversations, friendships, and debates. It's also led to countless other books being published. Even the great Star Wars series tips its hat to Dune, which gives you an idea of just how groundbreaking it was back in the day. Now, even though Dune is set in a distant future, it's a pretty stark warning about what could happen if we, as a society, don't pay close attention to our everyday actions. Written by Frank Herbert back in 1965, it was partly inspired by the author's research on the desert environment in Oregon. The whole project got him thinking about how our relentless search for resources might backfire. Herbert didn't hold back in sending out a pretty loud and clear mayday signal about our disregard for Mother Earth. He wanted to get the message across about the risks we're taking if we keep up our current pace. And you know what? People listened. Dune sold millions of copies and even snatched the prestigious Nebula Award for Best Novel. And it didn't just inspire bookworms. It reached out into the world of space exploration, too. A bunch of cosmic features, from a moon crater to a landscape on Titan, Saturn's moon, owe their names to the novel. And let's not forget about how much Dune has influenced our pop culture. It's become kind of a petri dish for new novels, music, games, comic books, and movies. Take the equally famous series, A Song of Ice and Fire, written by George R. R. Martin. Some say there are many parallels between the two fictional universes. Even the recent blockbuster movie Avatar may have drawn some inspiration from Frank Herbert's writing. Dune showed us the way to a new kind of science fiction storytelling, one that combined a careful consideration of our planet and expansive world-building. Music-wise, Dune left its footprints all over the place. A good example of this is Iron Maiden's song called To Tame a Land. Dune even jumped into the gaming world. The 1992 one, named simply Dune, was revolutionary for real-time strategy games. It also set the stage for many of the following games we enjoy today. And really importantly, Dune had a big impact on how we think about resources like oil and water through his gritty, realistic portrayal of a world on the brink of disaster. Frank Herbert wanted us to see the consequences of issues like overpopulation and wasteful resource management. Brian Herbert, Frank's son, described Dune as a tapestry of familiar myths. With its precious spice, melange, standing in for oil, and giant sandworms like dragons of old guarding it. The desert world of Arrakis with its raging sandstorms and mystery-shouted sandworms, reflects the reality of our world crises, and the characters feel eerily familiar, too. Now, when you read Dune, you might notice that it's got a bit of a somber vibe. It's like there's a cloud hanging over everything, which ties in with Herbert's message about the dangers we're facing. There's also a sense that he's trying to warn us about the consequences of our actions. Herbert was a master of using language to make a point. To this end, he used, for instance, the character of Baron Vladimir. He was a pivotal character in the novel, described as the cunning and ruthless leader of the House Harkonnen. Known for his massive physical stature and devious political machinations, the Baron sought to control the universe's most valuable resource, the Spice Melange, found only on the desert planet of Arrakis. He was also depicted as a formidable antagonist to the novel's protagonist, Paul Atreides, representing oppressive power, corruption, and treachery. Despite his malevolence, the Baron's intelligence and complex schemes make him a compelling character in the saga of Dune. And let's not forget the adaptations and awards. Turning Dune into a movie has been a tricky task, given its unique language, the detailed descriptions of the planets and their features, and the uncompromising way it handles character arcs. But that hasn't stopped people from trying. The first attempt in 1972 fell through, but David Lynch took it on in 1984. Then, in 2000, 
John Harrison adapted into a hit miniseries. There were a few hiccups along the way, but eventually, in 2021, a new Doom film was made. And a second one is due for release in 2023. Remember when I mentioned Dune was inspired by a real-life experiment? Its roots go all the way back to 1957, when Herbert was studying the works of the U.S. Department of Agriculture. If you've come across The Road to Dune, a companion book to the Dune novels, you might have stumbled upon an unfinished article named They Stopped the Moving Sands. That's the starting point we're talking about here. This article is the key reason why we've got Dune in the first place. This experiment was all about using what's known as poverty grasses. Picture hardy little plants that can survive and even flourish in barren, sandy, or poor soil conditions. Their main purpose was to stabilize the ever-shifting sand dunes, saving highways, cities, rivers, and lakes from getting engulfed. Herbert thought this was pretty cool, to say the least. He used this idea as the springboard to develop dune over the next half a decade. From this kernel of an idea, Dune grew into two shorter stories in a magazine, Dune World in 1963 and The Prophet of Dune in 1965. Later, these were pulled together into the novel that's now synonymous with Herbert's name in the world of social science fiction. The humble experiment gave birth to not just the books, but also the film adaptations we love. Now, about the terraforming of Arrakis in the books you'll find echoes of that same experiment there, too. Take the Freeman, for instance. In the book, these people were a hardy tribal society residing on the inhospitable desert planet of Arrakis. They're known for their deep blue eyes, a side effect of their consumption of the spice melange. The Freeman are exceptional survivalists, adapting to harsh desert conditions through a culture centered around water conservation. Their extreme resilience, superior combat skills, and intricate knowledge of Arrakis make them formidable in the political and military landscape. These amazing characters also had their own unique way of managing the unruly sand dunes, using plants. They were creating the conditions for a wetter, more hospitable planet. Dune is an epic journey of perseverance. And by that, I mean the story of its publishing, for starters. You see, Herbert was committed to getting this masterpiece out into the world and wanted it to be a standalone book. However, fate seemed to have different plans initially. At first, the manuscript was rejected by 20 publishers. You'd think somebody would have been enthralled by it, right? Unfortunately, most of them considered it to be very slow-paced and too complex for the general audience. Now here's where things start to get interesting. A man named Tom Doherty soon found himself absolutely captivated by Dune. In fact, he was so much of a fan that he wanted the publishing house where he was working at the time to scoop it up. Alas, despite his enthusiasm, he couldn't convince the management at his office to jump on board. But you know what they say, when one door closes, another opens. Doherty ended up working with Herbert as his publisher later on down the line. Soon enough, an editor from Chilton Books got his hands on the manuscript. Now, this company was famous for its business-to-business magazines and auto manuals, but they were looking to dip their toes into the world of fiction, too. They believed Dune could be the perfect piece to get them started on this new venture. To add a bit of fun to this epic tale, Herbert humorously suggested that maybe they could rebrand Dune to How to Repair Your Ornithopter to suit their automotive manual flavor. In case you're not familiar with this mode of transportation, in the Dune universe, an ornithopter is a flying machine designed to achieve flight by mimicking the flapping wing motion of birds, bats, or insects. Well, we've reached the end here, so I guess we're doomed.